uh, a series of interviews conducted and hosted by National Geographic Learning Vietnam. Uh, I'm, joining, I'm joining you from our office in Hanoi, and I'm Richie, I'm the English uh, language teaching specialist uh, from National Geographic Learning Vietnam. So EduVoice Vietnam is a platform that we created in the hope to bring you know, educators across the world to share their perspectives and viewpoints about the educational landscape in Vietnam. And we do this by interviewing members of the educational community. And by doing so, we hope to create a community of practice where uh, you are free to uh, share your perspectives uh, about education in Vietnam. So, uh, before we get into today's topic, which is mediation, I would like to uh, first of all send my sincere thanks to all of you for making your time uh, to join our talk show today. And also, I would like to thank my uh, entire National Geographic Learning Vietnam colleague, uh, our regional marketing team, for helping to make this happen. And also I would like to thank my colleague Andy, who will help me to moderate the chat box today, who will try our best to you know, respond to your comments and questions. And uh, if we run out of time, uh, we can always follow up on emails or, or Facebook. So today's theme is about mediation. And as you might have known, uh, mediation is uh, a new set of skills, uh, new descriptors that was incorporated in the updated uh, CFR, the Common European Framework for References in 2018. So why was it introduced uh, in the CFR? What is the importance or the significance of mediation? And you know, um, how many types of mediation there are? And most importantly, as teachers, what should we do to teach mediation in the classroom? As decision makers, what should we do to, you know, to help prepare our learners for future readiness? So these are some of the very basic questions that we would like uh, to address in the talk show today. And um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our very special guest today. Uh, so our guest today is uh, Chia Suan Chong. She is a writer. Uh, a communication skills trainer and an author for National Geographic Learning. And she has um, achieved a lot of success in you know, training teachers in uh, communication skills. And I am very excited and honored today to welcome uh, Chia to the show. So Chia, where are you? Could you please uh, turn on your uh, camera so that we can all see you? Hi everyone, Hello. hi Ju Voice, hi Chi. Xin chào mọi người. Okay, thank you. It's wonderful to hear you speak Vietnamese. I feel so close to you, much closer to you now. Oh. <laughs> okay, so um, I feel very grateful and very honored to have this opportunity to have a chat with you today uh, about the topic of mediation. But before we get into you know something uh, more academic or um, deeper uh, on the topic, could you share with us something about yourself? Could you, I'm curious to know, you know, um, what's your background and how you got to where you are today? So would you mind sharing with us? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I know you can talk hours on end, but we have only one hour I can, today. I really can. <laughs> we have only one hour today, so. Um, <laughs> Keep it short. Um, <laughs> So my backgrounds, um, I come from an acting background. Uh, I did communication skills, uh, communication studies uh, um, and broadcast and electronic media back at university in Singapore. Uh, and then I left Singapore and, and, and moved to the UK um, because at that time I was an actor and I wanted to expand my, my um, ability to, you know, choose work that is outside of my country. Uh, so I moved to the UK and, and, and started to teach English uh, and realized that actually, you know, that there was a lot of similarity between what I used to do as an actor and, you know, standing in front of students uh, and teaching. 
And, and, and so um, I, I got into teaching, really, really enjoyed it, really enjoyed the ability to really connect with students in the classroom. Um, but interestingly, as, I, my, as my career progressed and I started to become a teacher trainer, a CELTA tutor, uh, I did my master's in applied linguistics, my Delta, I started to realize that actually teach, as a teacher in the classroom, you couldn't really be further away from an actor standing on stage. So it was, it was just interesting to, to see how my opinion of what teaching has changed over the years, because uh, I remember observing this really great teacher who hardly performed. He, he, he was a facilitator, a mediator, a, a great mm -hmm. communicator. He was the bridge between students, shy students being able to communicate in English and practice speaking English. And he himself didn't do a lot of performing or, or, or um, mm -hmm. talking. He was just facilitating it, being that mediator, that bridge. And that was kind of what made me realize that actually, since we're talking about the topic of mediation today, a good teacher is someone who is a good mediator, mm -hmm. someone who creates a good atmosphere in the classroom and, and gives students that confidence to, to, to give their opinions and, and talk in front of others. Um, someone who is able to sort of oil the wheels of communication. And, um, so, and, and that fascinated me, uh, which is kind of why I think that English language teaching and mediation and communication skills, they all go hand in hand. Yeah, and acting as well. I, I, I can see that you are a, a great actress. Uh, I think a teacher and um, an actress have something very similar uh, that is both of you will be in the spotlight, right? But maybe when you are a teacher, you need to, to take a step back. You know, while, while you are an actress, you, you need to take, you need to show everything that you have, but for but being a teacher, you need to help the students shine. So I think that's the similarity and the difference between being an actor or actress and being a teacher. Interesting. Uh, I didn't know about that. Thank you for sharing a wonderful fact about you. So um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, could you please tell me, you know, what mediation is? You know, the, fir the first impression that I had when I first came across mediation is that, oh, it sounds like meditation. So <laughs> what, is, what is mediation? Could you give us some, some, some you know, brief and simple to understand definition of Right. So first of all, mediation is not meditation. You're not the first person to say this. I've heard other <laughs> teachers think, say to me, oh, is, is that like closing your eyes and trying to think of nothing? No. <laughs> mediation, as I said, is, is, is about being a bridge of communication. Um, I tell you what, I'm going to share my screen and give yes, you this. I'll give you the theoretical definition first mm -hmm. and then we'll make it you know, make it simple. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> so this is from the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, also known as the CEFR. And we know that CFR has a whole list of descriptors um, of can do statements, what students should be able to do or can do in order to consider themselves intermediate or upper intermediate, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and in 2018, the CFR came up with a whole new mode. So instead of just talking about reading, speaking, writing, listening, they started to look at reading, writing, a uh, reading and sorry, reading and listening as reception, speaking and writing as production. They also looked at interaction. And then they said, we need another mode, not just reception, production and interaction. We also need to look at mediation. And this was in 2018, but actually, mediation was talked about in the CFR um, documents for, you know, for much longer than that. Uh, back in the early 2000s, the CFR was already uh, men mentioning the idea of the importance of mediation. But in 2018, there were concrete descriptors of what mediation means. So and, this is the... And, and, and sorry to interrupt you. And, and, and why is that? So why did they make mediation much more explicit compared to the previous version of the CFR? I think we are realizing, and the CFR is also realizing that when we talk about how good someone is at speaking a language, for example, you wanna say someone is very good at English, 
what does that actually mean? And traditionally, we said, oh, they can write very well. Their grammar is very good. Their, their listening is very good. They can, they can read English books, for example. But I think CFR and, 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 and all of us are realizing that, you know, a, a good communicator is not just someone who can read well or do a good grammar. They, it, it, all these different skills interact with each other. When we're in an interaction, when we're in a conversation with each other, we are not just only listening or only speaking or only focusing on grammar. We are doing all those things. I'm listening to you. I'm thinking. I'm I'm responding. And while I'm responding, I'm also you know getting a feel of your reactions to what I'm mm-hmm. saying. All those things are playing together and and interacting with each other. And our students need to be able to do those things. Um, if you think about communicative competence we've been talking about Mm. Heim's definition of communicative competence what makes a student communicatively competent Um, now since Heim's we've expanded on the definition of communicative competence and we also aside from linguistic competence which is grammar lexis you know we are also we should also be looking at strategic competence that's how we um, get our point across in a conversation, whether we have those communication strategies to, to make our point clear, to ask people for their opinions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also look at sociolinguistic competence. Are we able to say the appropriate thing at the right time? We might have the correct grammar and lexis, but it might not be appropriate to that moment or to that person we are speaking to. So having that understanding of the sociolinguistic and sociocultural um, background of the other speaker, of the conversation we're having, of the topic is also really, really important. And I think when we when we talk about communicative competence, we naturally start to look at a lot of things that is described in the CFR descriptors of mediation, you know, the, the ideas of communicating, yeah. being appropriate, uh, talking to someone that's different from us. And as you can see here, highlighted in yellow, the ability to facilitate understanding, which is kind of what we said earlier, what teachers do. When students can't understand something, we, we say it again in a simpler way. We paraphrase, we use synonyms, we explain with examples. We do that naturally as teachers. Now, exactly. the key here is getting students to learn to do that too. How can we help students have those skills as well? Yeah, I think you make a very interesting point and I would like to... Uh, all of our audience to think about our own local context. I mean, the Vietnamese context of English language teaching. So uh, the Ministry of Education and Training, uh, we issued uh, the uh, curriculum, the English, lab, the English subject curriculum also in 29, sorry, 2018. Uh, and the overall goal uh, of the curriculum is to help learners develop communicative competence And uh, after your analysis, I now can understand where mediation fits in to our own local context. You know, I think every now and then we need to stop and take a look back and revisit the concept of communicative competence, like you said, and that develops over time. And I can see now where mediation comes in. So a very interesting point. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I did a very, you know, not a very thorough search on the updated CFR and I heard, and I know that there are several types of mediation. So could you please help us understand more about those types of mediation? What's the first type? And could you please give us some examples to, to help us understand more better? So let's go back to that analogy of the bridge, right? So a good mediator is a bridge, is it, they are able to be a bridge between two things or two people. So the first type of mediation is known as mediating texts. Here, we are a bridge between a text and a person. So if if you imagine you're a bridge, on one end of the bridge is maybe a listening text or a reading text. And on the other end of the bridge is somebody who wants you to help them understand this listening or reading text. Now, it sounds very complicated, but it could be as simple as you read a newspaper article, and you can't wait to tell your friend about it. So you turn to your friend and you're like, I read this article today and it's about this new movie that's out. And 
yada, yada, yada. So summarizing that text. Yes, exactly. So su the skills of summarizing, of paraphrasing. Of course, mediation is not taking that newspaper article and reading it to your friend word for word. <laughs> because you're not really being a bridge, you're just giving them the text. Mm -hmm. So you're summarizing, you're pulling out the key points. You might even offer your own opinions about that mm -hmm. article. So, oh, you know, this, this article is about this new movie that's out. I've seen the movie and this is my opinion about it. So it might not be a newspaper article. It could be that you heard a conversation, right? I might say, Chi, I heard someone talking about you the other day. You know what they said? They said, da, 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 da. that's mediation because I am the bridge between what I heard people say and mm -hmm. you, and I'm, I'm translating or conveying that, in, that information to you. Mediating a text also includes translation. So if mm -hmm. you ever have a situation where your boss at work says, I received this email in English. My English is not very good. Chi, your English is superb. Can you read this email and tell me what's about? Or I might say to you, Chi, I bought these um, noodles the other day. They look Vietnamese, but I can't understand the instructions. Could you read those instructions for me and just tell me in, in just a gist of what, this, what it's saying? Use Google That's Translate. <laughs> Use Google Translate. Google <laughs> Translator is, as we all know, not a very good mediator. But you know what? That is that is, is actually, you've hit the nail on the head there. Why is Google Translate not a very good mediator? Because they are, all they're doing is translating word for word. They're not fully understanding the sociolinguistic environment. They're not fully understanding the person they're speaking to. For example, if you, say, for example, are translating an email for your boss, and you notice that this email is actually spam. It's just mm. rubbish. Your boss doesn't really need to know every single detail of that email because it's a rubbish email, right? <laughs> so you might not say, okay, I'm going to translate word for word. You use your knowledge of the world and your knowledge of your boss. Mm. And you say, actually, you don't really need to know this. This is, this, this is for your bin. Google Translate can't do that because Google Translate <laughs> doesn't have that knowledge of the world, of your boss. And so that's what a good mediator is. They are mm. able to not just translate or convey the information or summarize, but they're also able to use the information they know about the person they're, they're talking to and, and, and the knowledge of the world, the experience of life, and put that all into how they communicate. Mm. So that's the first one, right? Mediating a yeah. text. And that that's sounds... quite easy for us teachers to, to incorporate, I think. I think so. I think a lot of uh, people in the audience today are teachers, and I think they will be very interested to know, you know, how they can help teach students mediating text. So could you quickly just give some, you know, common or some easy to use activities uh, for teachers? Absolutely. So um, some of these you probably already do. Um, say, for example, summarizing a text. We often do that, don't we? We say, read this article, summarize it for your partner. But if your partner's reading the same article, then you know there is no motivation for me to summarize it for my partner because why am I mediating something that my partner's already read? So to make it more authentic, more like the real world where you mediate it for someone who hasn't read the article, you might say, okay, student A, you read the first paragraph, student B, you read the second paragraph. Or student A, you read this article, and student B, you watch a video or a TED talk about the same topic. You both summarize different texts, and then you come together and you put your knowledge together and exchange information. We so, call this uh, jigsaw reading or jigsaw listening, and I'm sure many of you teachers already do something yeah. like that. And that, that is a great activity to help students feel motivated as they, as they mediate a text for their partner in class. So I think that mediating text is not something you know, too foreign uh, to us. So why don't we move on to the second type of mediation? What, what is it? And could you tell us more about that? Right. So the second type of mediation, mediation is called mediating concepts. Now, earlier, if you saw my slide, the, the, the general idea of mediation or the de general definition of mediation includes the idea of languaging. What is languaging? It sounds very fancy. What it really is, is the ability to put your thoughts into words. After all, without language, you know, are we able to think 
in such a complicated way as philosophically as we now do. People argue that language enables us to think. So languaging is part of that. It's, it's, it's the ability to put those thoughts into words. And of course, if you're dealing with a foreign language, like say your students are speaking English, that ability to put those opinions, those thoughts, those suggestions into English and speak them. Right. So it's, it's kind of what we do in the classroom. That's that's what teaching language is about. Um, so mediating concepts. Let me give you a more formal definition. Can you see my slides? Yes, I can. Right. So here's uh, the equals organization of that their definition of mediating concepts. I'm going to read it to you. Mediating concepts involve two complementary. Um, sorry, hold on a second. Two complementary aspects. On one hand, constructing and elaborating meaning, and on the other hand, facilitating and stimulating conditions that are conducive to conceptual exchange and development. Oh, sounds very, very theoretical. So let's put that in right. simple words. Yeah. On one hand, we're talking about being able to voice those opinions and create meaning in English. So students being able to give their opinions and talk in English. On the other hand, it's not just about you giving your own opinions. On the other hand, we are also helping other people give their opinions. This is, again, what teachers do, isn't it? We, we say, Chi, what do you think about this? Oh, Andy, you haven't spoken for a while. Do you have an opinion on this subject? Oh, um, Isla, Isla, I know you told me a story previously that's related to this topic. Can you share that with the class? We do that all the time as teachers. We facilitate, we encourage students to speak. We elicit language. Now, can we help students do the same? Can we, when we put students in groups to do group work, are they able to not only focus on their own opinions, but also, for example, notice that someone in the group has been very quiet for a while and get them involved in the conversation? Can they, for example, notice that someone in the group is having trouble expressing what they need to express in English and help them along with that, give them the right vocabulary to help them express themselves? All these things are, are in included in the idea of mediating concepts. So do you think, for example, do you think a CLIO or CBI content-based uh, you know, instruction teachers are actually doing mediating concepts. You see, I, I think teachers, very, a lot of teachers are very good at mediating concepts themselves. But I'm not sure how many teachers actively practice or get students to practice this in the classroom. We might do the first one, which is getting students to give opinions, you know, getting students to construct meaning, negotiate meaning. But I'm not sure how much practice we give students of facilitating and getting students to stimulate a good environment, a good group environment when they are working in groups. I mean, I think the first thing we do, obviously, is put students in groups um, and let them speak to each other in groups. And, and that, that alone would give them practice of these skills. But is that enough? Do we need to do something more explicit? Do we need to give them clear instructions or strategies or tools to help them do this better? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, mediating concepts is, is, you know, more difficult than mediating text because this involves, you know, uh, constructions of meanings and, and concepts. So it may require the teachers to do, you know, a lot more work in terms of helping students to be able to uh, develop those mediating skills. So um, do you have any suggestions for teachers to, you know, come up with activities that they can use in the classroom to, to build this skill? I, I think the first step, to be honest, the very first step is to just shine the spotlight on a slightly different thing in the classroom. So for example, if you put students in groups or in pairs and they're doing some kind of speaking activity, right? And you're walking around the class monitoring with your notebook, hopefully you're doing that, <laughs> and listening to the students speaking and you know taking notes so that you can give them feedback. 
many of us might focus on their grammar mistakes. For example, okay, you've said this wrongly. Let's give you some feedback. How can you say it better? We might focus on their lexis, you know, the vocabulary issues. We might focus even on their pronunciation. But how about also, also focusing on the way they are mediating concepts and the way they're mediating communication? It could be something as simple as saying, hey, Chi, I noticed that earlier when you were talking in a group, you really helped your friend Andy speak up. I know Andy was a bit shy and Chi, you really helped him along. You, 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 you got him to give his opinions and, and you noticed that he wasn't speaking as much and you really helped him to, to open up and speak up. And that was amazing what you did, Chi. To just give some praise when someone does it very well, when someone mediates concepts really well, when someone encourages their group mates to, 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 to speak up more. Or perhaps we might turn around and, and say, you know, Nia, um, you, I noticed that your group members were really, you know, they didn't really agree. They were disagreeing about a topic, but you managed to, to, to keep that atmosphere really positive and ensure that nobody was, you know, shouting at each other. And you, you, you managed that situation really, really well. So well done. So in your example just now, you briefly mentioned mediating communication. I'm curious about that. Is that a third type of mediation? And uh, could you, you know, help us understand more about that? Um, absolutely. So the third kind kind of overlaps with the second, which is mediating mm -hmm communication. So earlier we spoke about mediating concepts. Let's talk about mediating communication. So mediating communication is the ability to create a successful, effective atmosphere for people to talk to each other. Again, remembering that if you're a good mediator, you're a bridge. So you're also a bridge between two people. If two people don't agree, you need to be able to help them talk it out. You need to be able to bridge between the differences. You know, we might be different in many ways. We might be different in our communication style. We might be different culturally. We might have different opinions. And a good mediator is not afraid of those differences. They're able to, you know, use those differences and make it work. For that conversation and you know like Andy says in the chat box a lot of these things we kind of do good communicators kind of do it naturally mm. but we cannot rely on students you know naturally being good communicators right I mean lots of people are not good communicators so we really need to I feel um help students give them more strategies and tips to practice those skills. I'm just sharing with you the equals definition of mediating communication here. So see if you can spot the difference between mediating concepts, which we saw earlier, and mediating communication. The key words here are facilitate yes. understanding. So again, a good teacher does that. You know, if you are trying to explain a grammar concept and students look at you like they don't understand, what do you do as a good teacher? You help them understand. You put it in different words. You give them examples. You show them some pictures in order to help them to understand. And that's, that's what this is about, facilitating understanding and shaping successful communication between users or learners who have individual sociocultural, sociolinguistic or intellectual differences in standpoint. Sounds very complicated, but it could be something as simple as maybe Chi and I are talking about Vietnamese food and we love Vietnamese food. I mean, we, we, we're really passionate. We're talking about different dishes and Andy's in the conversation and Andy has no clue what we're talking about. He's never had Vietnamese food. He doesn't know the difference between Vietnamese food and Japanese food. So Chi being the good communicator and the good mediator turns to Andy and says, Andy, um, Chi and I are just talking about um, Vietnamese spring rolls, and they're a little bit different from the other kind of spring rolls, you know, the Chinese spring rolls, because, and et cetera. So Chi fills Andy in and brings him into the conversation because she knows that Andy doesn't have the same background knowledge as she and myself, right? And, and that is about shaping successful communication. And, and creating this positive 
atmosphere so that Andy walks away from that conversation feeling good, feeling included, feeling like he was part of the interaction and not just, you know, left on the side wondering what spring rolls are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so could you, like, yeah, I understand better now what mediating communication is, but could you give us some examples or some personal experiences where uh, you think mediation is critical in helping to shape uh, the successful communication. Or you can give us some examples where you think communication broke down because of the lack of mediation. I can do better than that. I can show you an activity that I use with students that includes what you just said. Um, Great. So let's see, can you see this slide? Yeah. Right. So here's a little story, as you say, an example about communication that has gone wrong a little mm. bit. Let me read it to you. Natalia has been meeting up with Killian every week to practice chatting in English. She finds it easy to understand Killian's English and really enjoys the conversation. She told him, that she would love to know more people she could speak English with. So one day, Killian introduced her to his English friends. Natalia was very excited, but she soon started feeling lost during those conversations. When they were speaking about the television programs they watched and the snacks they ate when they were children, Natalia found it hard to follow what they were saying. She became less confident about her English and became very quiet during these conversations. What do you think was happening here? What do you think Natalia was feeling? What do you think was going through Natalia's mind? I think I've been there. Yes. I, I think so. I, I, I'm reflecting on my you know, early years of being a student of English. So I often you know, went to uh, an English speaking club and one day there were a group of foreigners coming in to visit and they spoke the kind of English that I couldn't understand. And I felt, felt somewhat similar to Natalia here in this conversation. I felt overwhelmed with you know, how much English I was exposed to and I couldn't respond or you know, engage in the conversation. So I think maybe in this case, uh, that's what Natalia felt. Is that the problem? Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and it's thanks for sharing because I, I would hope to think that this is a very relatable story, a very re relatable situation. Um, Hang Yuan has just written in the chat field saying that Natalia may feel that she's not good enough. And you're absolutely right. Um, it feels to me like Natalia is blaming herself a little bit that, you know, it's my English, it's my vocabulary. If only I had more grammar, if only I had more vocabulary, I would be okay. Mm. But is that really the situation though? Is it Natalia's English level and ability to use the right grammar that's causing this problem? If you care to share with us in the chat field what you think about the situation, it uh, looks like some people are already doing that. Jazza says, um, Natalia felt that she's out of context. Oh, okay, so she, she doesn't really understand what's going on, I assume, yeah. Ed says, Killian, oh, that's interesting. Killian might have graded his language when he's talking one-on-one, -on -one, but when they're in a group situation, they are not you know, they're not purposely grading their language, they're just talking naturally. And that might be an issue as well that might be new to Natalia. And that can be quite scary when, when you're in a group situation and everyone is speaking and, 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 and you're kind of confused. You, you don't know what's going on. Um, yes, she might lack communicative strategies. Thank you for that. And, and that's, that's where I think we teachers can help. We can give them those communicative strategies uh, and get, let them practice those strategies in the safety of a classroom so that they're prepared when they really encounter these situations in real life outside the classroom. Um, and Chi, you said that it could be also cultural differences. You're all right here. Now, what I've just shown you here is is a story about Natalia and Killian. And this, the, these types of stories are known as critical incidents. 
the use of the critical incident technique was founded in the area of psychology. So, you know, people used it uh, to study the psychology of different people. But very soon, this technique was started, started to be used by intercultural trainers. So people who are experts in intercultural communication, intercultural skills. And we use critical incidents like these ones to help students or clients put themselves in the position, in the shoes of different people. So in this case, I could say to students, how do you think Natalia might be feeling? How do you think Killian might be feeling? What advice would you give Natalia? What advice would you give Killian? And of course, the most important question we often ask when using these types of critical incidents is, what would you do if you were Natalia? What would you do if you were Killian? In this way, students are able to unpack and discuss the story, discuss the scenario, but still feel safe because it's a hypothetical situation. It's not outside the classroom. They're still doing it in pairs, in groups. And what I love about using these types of critical incidents is students inevitably start to say things like, you know, I've been in that situation myself, or I know a friend, I have a friend who was exactly like this. And they start to bring in personal stories and they start to share, if they want to, of course, um, and, and they personalize these situations because the situations themselves are very, very relatable. And so I, I, I often strongly encourage teachers to use critical incidents like these ones in their classrooms, put students in pairs, in groups, and just say, you know, what would you do? What would you do if you were Natalia? What advice would you give them? Yeah, and I think the key thing here is to select um, the kind of input or creative context or giving stories that students feel relatable to them. Uh, and meaningful to them, and then uh, they can start sharing more and practice being mediators. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think what you're saying here is echoed by um, a few people in the chat field as well. Um, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, but Thieu, is that correct? Thieu. Thieu, right? Yeah. He says that mediation might be a skill that both sides need. And you're absolutely right. This is exactly why we're talking about mediation here today, because Killian and his friends could have recognized that, oh, Natalia is not very included in this conversation. Maybe we should, you know, try and include her more, make her feel a bit better. You know, maybe she's feeling not just you know, there's not just the English, it's also new people. It's always hard, isn't it? You, you, you are the new person in a big group. Everyone knows each other. Everyone has a relationship, a history with each other. And you are the person who's kind of feeling a bit lost. You don't know what's going on. They're talking about stuff, topics that you know nothing about. So yes, Killian and his friends could have tried to include her a bit more. And she also could have spoken up perhaps and used certain communication strategies to to get herself into that conversation more, perhaps by saying, oh, what, what, what's that TV program you're talking about? What, what, what was the program about? Maybe we have something similar in, in, in my country, you know, that sort of thing. So having that confidence to, to, to do that, it can be tricky, can't it? So do you think in this story, um, the problem could be in the intercultural skills uh, that the people in the conversation uh, are facing or, or how having some problems with? Could that be, do you think? I think that's definitely, it's, it's, I think it's all part of it. You know, the, the, the Killian and his friends are, just, are, are talking about TV programs that they watched and snacks that they ate when they're children forgetting that that knowledge is not something that Natalia has because Natalia didn't grow up in the same place, didn't watch the same TV programs, didn't eat the same snacks. Um, and, and when we talk about intercultural skills, we often forget about little things like these, like mediation skills. So the, the ability to understand and to spot situations like these ones where one person's feeling left out or one person's different from everybody else and having that adaptability, that those accommodation skills to bring that person in to their conversation. And, and that is part of being um, culturally, interculturally competent as well. Thank you very much. 
Um, I think all of us here are teachers, most of us here are teachers, and I think um, they are very interested in, you know, getting to know how they can help teach what I think is the most difficult type of mediation that is mediating communications. Do you think it's, it's too much to ask teachers to teach you know, mediating communications? Because based on my personal observation, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there are many programs out there that helps teachers teach mediating communications. At most, maybe what we have ready is, you know, mediating text, you know, summarizing a text or, you know, paraphrasing or something like that we can find, or, you know, we can find mediating concept activities in um, content-based instruction programs. But what about, you know, mediating communications? Do you have, you know, as an expert, do you have any tips or any advice for us? You are so, so right. It's, it blows my mind to just think that communication mediation is so much part of what we do. You know, what are we doing as te English teachers? We are here to help our students become better communicators. We are here to help our students go out there into the real world and use English as this wonderful tool they have in their toolbox to speak to anyone not just people from England or America, but anyone from across the world and use English as that, as that common language, that common tool that they share with their conversation partner. Knowing that, how come is it that teaching communication skills and intercultural skills is not part of what we naturally do? And of course, when I say that to teachers, some teachers start to say, oh, but you know, I've never done it before. You know, I've, I've done the present perfect and <laughs> I've done lexical lists, but I've never taught communication skills or intercultural skills. So how can you expect me to suddenly be an expert in that? Well, we don't. We don't expect teachers to be experts in those areas in the same way that if you are helping students read an article about, I don't know, quirky homes around the world, or, or if you're getting students to listen to two people talking about how to keep fit, you don't need to be an expert in how to keep fit or quirky homes around the world, but yet we still use those topics in our English lessons, don't we? We get students to do group projects like design your ideal school, or what five things would you bring if you were trapped in a desert island? We're not experts in dis designing schools or being trapped in desert islands, but we use those topics as, as vehicles to help students learn English and communicate about a topic. We can do exactly that with critical incidents, with communication skills. We can give students a story like the story you just saw about Natalia and Killian and you can get students to talk about it because just by talking about it and discussing it, students become more aware of what's happening when we communicate with people. They become more aware of the skills that are needed. They become, become, become more aware of their own assumptions, their own communication styles and how that might be different from others. And I've just finished writing um, and, and we've just launched uh, a new series called Voices with National Geographic Learning. Um, and the, the thing that I'm super excited about is that in every unit, there is a two page lesson about communication skills, intercultural skills, uh, mediation skills that are that are, you know, really easy for teachers to use. So teachers don't need to be experts. They just need to go. Step one, according to this page, is put students in pairs and ask them these three questions. OK, great. Step two. Here's a story about Natalia and Killian put students in pairs and get them to talk about these stories, tell, the, tell each other what advice they might give Natalia and Killian. Step three, play the video. The video is going to give students a bit more information about strategies or skills that they can use, things that they can be aware of, and then put students in groups and give them a chance to role play some of these critical mm -hmm. incidents. So yeah, I, I saw the slides. Yeah, could you share with us more about this role play activity? 
So Amir, very nice. Amir uh, said role plays just as I'm about to show role plays. I, I did not pay Amir to say that. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Amir. Thank, thank you, Amir, for mediating my thoughts so well in the chat box. Um, okay, so here we have um, an activity that follows um, earlier what you saw. So you saw a critical incident with Natalia and Killian. And after that, students would have watched a video and they would have discussed some of these important communication skills. Um, and then near the end of this lesson, we give students a chance to role play the same situation. So here, because the topic of this lesson is about communicating in groups and um, participating in group conversations. You know, we, we saw with the Natalia situation that it can be really hard to participate in a group conversation, especially when everyone's speaking quickly in a language that is not your first language, it's, it's, it can be scary. So here are some situations that we get students to role play. Number one, everyone is talking about a popular place in town that they all know. You are the only person who doesn't know what they're talking about. So in groups of three or four, for example, we get students to play the situation out and they could take turns being you in that situation. By this point, students would have already watched the video. They have a list of communication strategies and skills like top tips and some useful language that they can use to deal with these situations. And they, they, they play this out. If you look at number three, that's a little bit different here. Everyone is talking about the people in their family, except one quiet member of your group. You notice this and you try to include that person. So here the tables are turned. You're not the quiet one. You're not the insecure one. There's somebody else in the group that's being very quiet. How can you be the good mediator? How can you include them? How can you try and um, elicit opinions or, or, or conversation from this person? As you can see, these role plays are, are simple. They are not, we are not asking students to perform. You know, some students really don't like role playing. Um, so to reassure students, this is not about staging a performance. Nobody needs to do this role play in front of the class. It's a group activity. You do it in your groups of three or four, and you are not expected to do it in front of more people. The idea is to just play out a situation that is very likely to happen outside the classroom so that you get a rehearsal run. You get practice of doing this before you encounter it in the real world. Yeah, so bring mediation to life, you know, from the classroom to life uh, by having students practice uh, what absolutely. we have in the program. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this is just one, one lesson. This lesson is about, um, you know, helping students to participate in group conversations, which can be quite intimidating or overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But there are other types of uh, communication skills and mediation skills that we practice here. And, you know, we look at things like intercultural skills. For example, we might look at different ways that we look at time, for example. Um, I don't know if you've ever had this situation, perhaps, where, um, you know, you are really organized and you, you are the kind of person who, you know, eats pizza on a Friday and visits your parents on a Thursday and you have a very strict routine and then you meet someone who is the opposite of you, right? They, they are like super chilled, go with the flow. They arrive, they tell you they're arriving at four o'clock and they arrive at 4.30 and they're like, chill, man, it's okay. Why are you so stressed all the time? <laughs> Have you ever had a situation like that? <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing here because that's exactly what happened to me once. And I will never ever forget about this uh, incident. And if you don't mind, I would like to quickly share with you oh, yes, and please. my friends and colleagues here uh, in Native Voice Vietnam today. So I, I have a friend, her name is uh, Flo. She's actually one of my best friends. Uh, so one day uh, we decided to go to an event organized by uh, Melting Pot Hanoi. So this organizer, uh, held an event, uh, a dumpling festival event uh, in a big garden in the outskirts of Hanoi. So we decided to go there and we planned uh, to meet at 6 p.m. on a Friday, you know. And then I dressed up uh, very beautifully, got excited, and then uh, 15 minutes before uh, our appointment time, I texted her and said, 
I'm in the taxi. See you there. No response. Okay, okay, I think mm, maybe she's busy. She'll respond shortly. So I arrived at the venue on time, but she wasn't there. I said, mm, okay, because she, actually my friend is kind of often always like 10 to 15 minutes late to meetings. So I'm kind of used to that. And then I sat down, ordered a couple of dumplings and uh, tried to eat as little as possible because I want her companion, you know, I want her company to enjoy the foods with me. And then half an hour passed by, I texted her, no response. I even called her a couple of times, no response at all. And then at that point, it kind of, I think it was the final straw. Like I couldn't stand anymore. I even couldn't enjoy the food or I couldn't even enjoy the music. So I decided to stand up and go home. Oh, so I, no. grabbed, I grabbed the taxi and go home. And then, um, you know what? An hour later, she called me back. But I was so furious. And I knew that I would, you know, we would run into a big quarrel if I picked up her call. So I decided to not pick up the call because I was still so angry. And then my evening was ruined. So that's the, the sad story that I would like to share with you. Maybe, you know, as an educator, uh, as a communication expert, what do you think about it? Do you think the breakdown of communication was because of the concept of time? or because of you know, me not being able to understand my friend's perspectives or, you know. I think there are a couple of things at play here. Um, you know, there's clearly um, from, from the history of your relationship, you can already tell, like you said, there are two different ways of looking at time. Um, you have a different, you know, you might say it's a personality thing. Some people say it's a cultural thing. It could be both. Um, and you just have different styles of being. And in and, and this particular, you know, in this particular situation, we're looking at just time, how we treat time, how organized we are, how punctual we are. Um, and I think the, the key thing to notice here is that when people are different from us, it's we, we tend to jump to conclusions and we tend to make a judgment. Now that judgment might be right or wrong, but that's not the point. We tend to make judgments. So if, if I'm always on time and someone is constantly late, I might say things like, oh, they're so rude. They're so disrespectful. They don't respect my time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's frustrating. You know, they, they do things the way they want to do it. They're not respecting me. Um, and of course, the other person, if we put ourselves in the other person's shoes, they might say, oh, that person is always so stressed, so <laughs> uptight, you know, they need to take life a bit more, you know, take it easy a bit more, <laughs> chill out a bit more, you know, they're going to get, they, they're going to make themselves ill if they continue to be so stressed all the time. <laughs> so everyone has their own perspective. And I think the key is this, is, is the, the ability to take a step back from your own expectations your own style of communication um and just kind of go hang on a minute you know what why are they behaving that way what is driving that behavior what attitudes what values what beliefs do they hold that makes them be, be, behave in that way does any of those do any of those beliefs attitudes values align with my own is there anything that I can relate to that's but of course, a key thing here in your situation is having that conversation with your friend. It's a difficult conversation. And that's the other thing. You know, we, we, it, we look at so many course books that do not cover this really important topic of how to have difficult conversations. Mm. And again, we, in Voices, we do that. We have units um, in, in different levels that address how to have these difficult conversations. So I'm going to put this back to you, Chi. Did you have that difficult conversation with your friend? Did you eventually ask her, why did you not turn up for that dumpling festival? No. <laughs> did you find Never. that right? Weeks later, because I was so upset with her, I broke down the communication. I stopped communicating with her. Uh, but weeks later, she did explain to me that she got into an emergency situation with her son. Uh, I then blamed myself for not being patient enough. But actually, you know, at that, at that time, all I was thinking is that 
I was giving her all of my patience when she's like she was like half an hour late and she has always been late for our appointments. And that's the final straw. But then, you know, what you've just analyzed really helped me a lot. Maybe, you know, tomorrow I will ask her out for a drink and, you know, ask her questions and try to find like her values, her, her, her beliefs and her perceptions of time, what drives her to, you know, always be five or 10 or 15 minutes late, mm -hmm. see if I can understand her perspectives. And maybe, you know, next time we have an appointment, maybe if I want to meet her at six, maybe I will ask her to meet at 5.30. <laughs> and then, you know, lower my expectation. Yes, uh, yes, and yes. She will <laughs> appear, you know, she will show up at six. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. It was because she had an emergency with her child. And I, I think that's another example of how we jump to conclusions, right? We say, oh, that's so disrespectful. And then later you find out, oh, my goodness, she was late because she had to take her son to hospital. Maybe I shouldn't have jumped to that conclusion, right? Maybe we should have given given them that 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 benefit of the doubt. And that's something that we help students do as well with these lessons is to help them to take a step back and consider what other interpretations might there be of the situation? You know, what, why do you think Killian was behaving that way? Why do you think Natalia was behaving that way? Let's just explore this story. And, and like, like you've just done, you know, and, and hopefully everyone tuning in today can see this, you've shared a lovely personal story. And the, 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 if this were a lesson, it would be, you know, one that had a lot of nice speaking activities, it, very personalized speaking tasks. Um, and at the same time, we're talking about something that is really relatable, really apl applicable to real life. And we were preparing ourselves both mentally and also linguistically for those situations to arise in the future. Um, yeah. and, and, and it is, doesn't have to be difficult to do. We can, we can have these conversations in our classroom and students mm -hmm. can share their stories about their friends or, or, or or choose not to if they want. Um, and, and, and it doesn't have to be a difficult thing to carry out in the classroom to help students practice those very valuable skills. I've just put up a slide um, because we were talking about uh, some activities and some lessons from voices. Um, I just wanted to show you the beautiful covers because they are so beautiful. <laughs> um, but this is the new series from National Geographic called Voices. Um, it's called Voices because it's about helping students find their voice in English. To help students be able to speak up in conversations, to help students be able to mediate group conversations, to mediate situations, uh, have difficult conversations, have the right communication strategies to build relationships, build rapport, influence people, um, you know, listen actively, maybe to friends who are telling them their problems. Um, all these skills are covered in every single unit of voices. And, and I'm super excited about it because as we said, we don't often see this in English language teaching materials. And now we do. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think an hour has passed by so fast. I think we are coming to the end of our session today. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and share wonderful perspectives and insights about you know, being a good communicator, being a good mediator. And um, the key takeaway that I have from what you've shared today is that actually we teachers our natural uh, mediators in the classroom. We actually mediate all the time. And uh, being a good mediator is the bridge. You keep referring to the bridge, you know, putting yourself into the shoes of others and being the bridge to bring people together. And I think as teachers, we shouldn't, you know, stop at teaching mediating text or mediating concepts, but we should, you know, push our boundaries go further into teaching mediation, uh, sorry, teaching um, mediating communications, because that will help prepare your learners for the future. And I think that's not just for teachers, but that's also something for, you know, um, curriculum developers to think about, textbook developers uh, or decision makers, you know, rectors, principals, head of English departments to think about to include those new skills in their own curriculum and textbooks. So yeah, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, before we start, uh, I would like to have some closing messages uh, that I would like to share with you. Um, so 
to help you uh, further advance your professional development, we have a series of professional development webinars coming up in March, where we invite you know, international experts to talk about different topics for young learners and teens uh, on academic English skills and content-based English. So uh, please stay tuned on our Facebook for upcoming events. Um, we also have you know, global webinars where we do, um, we invite international experts to talk about topics uh, for different uh, types of learners. So feel free to check out our website uh, for uh, the webinars that you feel interested in. Um, and for those of you uh, who would like to go back to watch our recording today, uh, please feel free to visit our Eduvoice Vietnam website uh, at ngalasia.com slash eduvoicevietnam. Uh, in the next few days, we'll upload the recording and um, feel free to share it with your friends or you know, uh, watch the recording again. And we'll be very excited to hear uh, further thoughts or sharings from you. Uh, and uh, to help us improve our upcoming EduVoice episodes, uh, please spend a few minutes to fill out our short survey, let us know your feedback, and give suggestions for our future uh, sessions. So um, with that said, I would like to end our interview today. I would like to uh, send my thank to my colleagues. Uh, to my beloved author, Chia, thank you so much for making your time. Uh, thank you for having me. Session today. And thank you all of you teachers, uh, educators, decision makers for making your time uh, to join our chat today. Uh, lovely to see you all. Uh, I think some of my friends are here today as well. So uh, see you uh, on Facebook and on emails if you wanna uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, that's it for today. Stay safe from COVID. Uh, don't get infected. If you have unfortunately got infected like me, don't get reinfected. Happy teaching. Bye-bye.